We know that Aboriginal cultures are the oldest continuous cultures in the world. And if you're like me and you're interested in the subject of the, the crossroads of astronomy and culture, what better place to come than a place this, that is this ancient? When I go to communities and I sit with the elders and they, we just have an open conversation, you know, I usually just ask some very basic questions, you know, what kind of stuff do we have about the moon and the sun or certain stars? And as we have these conversations, the stuff they start telling me you know, really opens up. They start you know, telling about the traditions, the songs, the dances, the stories, just about sort of the abstract knowledge as well. But what I find really fascinating is when we're having these discussions and they're not, they don't sit here and say, well, here's the science behind this tradition. They just have a, a general discussion about it. But in the back of my mind, I'm going, oh my God, there's so much science here. And I'm just sort of ticking all these boxes off in chemistry and physics and meteorology and geology, running down the list. And the knowledge is incredibly deep. Everything on the land is reflected in the sky. Everything you need to know to survive about how the seasons work, the animals, the plants, the landscape is reflected in the sky. The sky is a textbook. It's a law book. It's a science book. You can't talk about that star without talking about this plant this animal, this landscape feature, this season, everything is linked. And one of the fascinating things about researching astronomy from an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander perspective is that as a researcher, as an academic, with my background training in astrophysics and you know, learning about indigenous cultures, I have to learn about ornithology, about herpetology, about insects, about meteorology and geology, all these areas that I don't know that much about. I have to learn about all that. And the, the breadth of knowledge you need to try to understand that is, is quite significant. There's all kinds of layers of knowledge. And some communities talk about there being over 30 layers of knowledge. And a lot of the, what I've learned from this, what my students have learned from this, really are the bottom levels of knowledge. You know, everything that I've learned here, I've learned from community, from elders. Obviously, this is not my knowledge. But they've been very generous in sharing some of their lower levels. And their lower levels of knowledge are quite detailed. It's like a pyramid. You know, the, the base level, everybody knows. Um, but as you get higher and higher and higher, fewer and fewer people know some of that really high detailed knowledge. Some is restricted by initiation. Some is restricted by gender, whether it's men's business or women's business. You know, there's all kinds of different uh, restrictions and, and qualifications on who can know that or who can possess that knowledge or be curators of that knowledge. I would heard something about the twinkling of stars meaning something. So I asked one of the elders, can you talk to me about a bit and tell me about what the twinkling of stars mean. And I had multiple elders going into all kinds of detail about how you read the twinkling of stars. Not just that they twinkle, but how you read it. So they sat with me and they say, well, we look at how the stars twinkle. We know how to read the stars. It's one of the phrases they use quite often, the Torres Strait and with Aboriginal people, how to read the stars. And they'll say, you look at the bright stars that are high above, because they're the best ones to look at. You look at the bright ones. You look at how they twinkle. Are they twinkling really rapidly? Or are they twinkling slowly? Are they kind of sharp? Or are they kind of fuzzy? Um, what colors are they? And I'm like, this is neat. What does that tell you? And they start explaining to me how they use this to predict weather, how they use this to predict seasonal change, trade winds. Um, you know, when the stars appear very blue and a bit fuzzy, they know they need to begin planting crops right now. They know they're not going to go out on the reef that night to go hunting for dugong or turtle, for example, because the rain's coming. So up in the tropics, you've got the, the cooler, drier southeasterlies and the hot, humid northwesterlies. The northwesterlies bring the monsoon rains. So what you see at that time of the year, when the stars are twinkling, is a shifting of the trade winds. And they know how to read that and know when the next season's going to come. As we're sitting with the elders, I'm, I'm recognizing all the science encoded in these stories and this knowledge, and I just find that, I find it fascinating, but not surprising at all. We would expect people over 65,000 years to figure this stuff out, of course. The Torres Strait Islanders, this is the island of Moa, the village of Kuban here, would actually look, there's lots of little islands all over the place out here. What the people do is look at where the sun sets between the islands or over the islands. So there's one particular island right here, it's got a peak there and a peak there. There's a bit of a flat part in the middle. When you look and see the sun setting on the flat part, then you know that it's a solstice. When it's down here, it sets between, just right at the very edge of this island, 
you know, it's the summer solstice and that the monsoon wet season is going to be pretty much imminent. This happens on the 21st of December. Wet season starts at the end of December. It ties in very nicely. There's so much knowledge encoded in the landscape. It's the landscape is literally telling a story. And there are lots of examples about how that links to the sky. Aboriginal and Islander cultures in Australia didn't have a structured written language. Was information put to writing? Yes, it was. But it wasn't a structured written language. What we had here and have here are oral cultures. And this is pretty much everywhere around the world up until a few thousand years ago. Orality is really a phenomenal concept, and it's one that's critically important to understanding not only the scientific information encoded in oral tradition, but how this knowledge can be passed down for so long without degrading. The ways that the elders are able to encode so much knowledge and pass it down is something called the method of loci. And that's something, that term itself comes from the ancient Greeks, the ancient Greek orators would use the idea that you could associate a memory with a place. And the place can be anything. It can be an object. It can be the landscape. It can be the skyscape. So when I work with communities, I notice they encode everything into stories, into narratives, into songs, into dances. And it's also encoded in the landscape. And all of that is reflected in the skyscape. So there's multiple layers of, of uh, memorization, so to speak, where you can take all this knowledge and apply it to anything. The human brain has evolved to memorize vast quantities of information. It's the human brain's ability to associate memory with place. And a place can be anything. It can be something tangible. It can be something a little bit more abstract. But when I say place, I mean the landscape, the skyscape, it can be a physical object, this thing here. I can associate memories to the different colors, the different textures, the different appearances, the different feeling, pretty much anything. We tell stories. Or we'll I, don't, I, I try not to use the word story too much, and I don't like to use the term myth and legend, because myth and legend are very loaded terms. Modern colloquial English, myth is the opposite of fact. So when we talk about, I, I don't use the term Aboriginal myths, but these are narratives, these are stories where you pass on, you encode information in that story, and you pass it on. So if you're going to memorize everything, you don't want to have long, dry lists of boring facts. Well, having a very interesting narrative where you tell a story, and you've got you know, supernatural figures coming down from the sky and morphing into animals with superhuman feats of strength, these kinds of things are going to be things you remember. It doesn't necessarily mean that you believe this is actually what it was, physically was like this. Because each community's got their own different types of traditions and narratives. But the idea is you can remember information a lot easier if you do that. Song and dance. You've got a pretty amazing ability to remember song lyrics. So if you take that knowledge, you encode it in story, you also encode it in song, and then you action it out through dance. And then through social practices, through craftsmanship, through artifacts, you're able to take huge amounts of knowledge, encode that into these things, and then pass it on through the generations. We don't have to worry so much about that knowledge degrading over time because there's very strict protocols on how this is done. It's done through ceremony where there's reward for doing it correctly and punishment for doing it wrong. Each of the different languages in Australia is different. There are some that are similar families. There are some that are complete and totally different, a completely different language group altogether. So what we've learned from the communities is, you know, there's a lot of trade. There's a lot of networks that go that crisscross the country. You know, the idea that Aboriginal communities were somehow isolated in these little spots just isn't true. There was trade all across the country, trade with Indonesians, with Melanesians. And one of the, the major ways this, these trade works were put together were through song lines. So basically, you're, you're singing the traditions as you go across the landscape. And the songs tell you where the water holes are. They tell you where the shelter is. They tell you where the animals are. But the song lines can stretch from coast to coast, north, south, east, west. And the song lines are in different languages. As you're singing the song, when you get to new country, the language of the song changes. So you can actually navigate your way across the landscape by knowing these song lines. For tens of thousands of years, Aboriginal people and Torres Strait Islander people have paid incredibly close attention to the world around them, and still do today, have developed knowledge systems that are more complex than we could ever imagine are as intellectually capable as anybody else, if not much more, and that their traditions have a very detailed scientific component that we can learn from if we just shut up and listen.